sins before God and one another. Almighty and merciful God, you created and are created still. In your presence our limits lie stark before us. We confess our unclean lips, our cold hearts, our turning away from neighbors, our broken promises, and our unrepentant hours. Forgive us, O Holy One. We confess that we have squandered the gifts you have given. We have neglected the land. We have grasped for goods. We have used each other. We have loved power more than people. Forgive us, O Holy One. Cleanse us from the illusion of innocence. Come into our hearts and make us new again. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Almighty God, who in great, who's great in mercy and promises forgiveness of sin to all who truly repent and are sincere in faith, have mercy on you, pardon and deliver you from all sin, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life. Glory to God in the highest and peace to God's people on earth. Holy One, Heavenly God, Sovereign God and Creator, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, God's only begotten One, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of majesty. Receive our prayer, for you alone are the Messiah. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in the glory of the Triune God. Amen. The Old Testament lesson for this morning is from Psalm 118, Selected Verses. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, His steadfast love endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. There are glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has punished me severely, but he did not give me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The Word of the Lord. The second lesson for Easter Day is from the book of Acts. So it's not an epistle, it's just from the book of Acts. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That message spread through Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. How he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. 
All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Here ends the lesson. Listen to the Gospel of Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew, the 28th chapter, verses 1 through 10. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guard shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. For he has been raised, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has been raised from the dead, and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. This is the good news. So here we are on Easter morning in a strange place in our own time waiting for the good news. Waiting for the good news with all the passion of hearts that are frazzled and confused and tired. Those are exactly the ways those people felt in that first century. They felt frazzled and confused and tired. They had seen Jesus die. They had buried him. They were doing the most loving thing they knew how to do. The two women had come to anoint his body. But the body was not there. They were confounded, totally astounded by the angel at the tomb. So hold that picture in your mind, and then you know what's going to happen. I'm going to talk about what came before. We're going back to Matthew 26, verse 37, when Jesus was talking to the disciples before the crucifixion. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters because of me tonight, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate. Having already had the crucifixion now, and having been worried that the, the people would try some clever thing to confound those who are left who, who followed Jesus. So they said, Sir, we remember what the imposter said when he was alive. After three days I will rise again. Therefore, command the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may go and steal him away and tell the people he has been raised from the dead. And that last deception would be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers. Go, make it as secure as you can. So they went with the guard and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone. They were surprised by joy. And the women started back to the disciples to tell them what had happened. No. In some Gospels, it's kind of a hard sell for them to get the disciples to believe him. Matthew's pretty sparse about what he says. 
This is the climax of his gospel, and he's not about to put in a lot of other stories to, um, to elaborate it, because he thinks the truth as he knows it is enough. So the, the girls went back toward the disciples, and the guards at the tomb um, woke up, and they saw the tomb was empty, and they headed toward the city to tell the chief priests what had happened. After the priests had assembled with the elders, they devised a plan to give a large sum of money to the soldiers, telling them, you must say, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. If it comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story is still told among the Jews to this day. So that's how they dealt with the fact that Jesus' body was not there, that the tomb was open, that they had, they had been knocked senseless by the events that opened the tomb and, and Jesus rising. And then this is the very last part of Matthew because Matthew does not have a lot of um, stories to tell about Jesus after he rose. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, to the end of the age. And that's the end of the Gospel. Very sparse, but full of everything we need to believe and to carry on. I want to talk to you this morning about believing and carrying on. I had brought with me today this cup. It's a wooden cup. It looks very much like a communion chalice, doesn't it? This was made by a, a former parishioner who's now passed away, Larry Corr, and he gave it to me when I was 35 years old, the first year that I was at the church. He made it himself. Now the interesting thing about Larry is that he was an amazing woodworker, but he had had an injury far before I knew him that took part of his hand. When you think about what it takes to do work like this, which is done on a lathe, done very carefully and beautifully, and then sanded and finished, you probably think that it would take somebody with two hands that were very well coordinated, but Larry only had one hand and a partial. And he still made the most beautiful things. The thing that I remember about Larry was how giving he was. When I was installed at the church, he brought a bouquet of roses that was this big around from his garden. He must have picked every bloom that looked good for that day. And he was delighted to have that color and that scent and the love he put into his flowers be part of that installation service. When I look at this cup, I think about what can happen even if some of the skills we have are lost. When there is a desire within the human heart to still give to the world. Larry had that to the very end of his life. In the later years of his life, the last few years, he lived in Blair in assisted living, and he found a special place for himself there too. He helped them arrange tables for supper, make sure people got to their places, and he knew that what he did made people's lives better. 
He took the stories of Jesus and he applied them to his life in ways many of us would not have thought possible, as long as he could still give to others, he felt like he was doing what Jesus had called him to do. Now Larry's story is repeated over and over and over again in the world by people who find limitations and either find ways around them and get back to full strength or find ways with whatever they've lost to still be a part of life and making life better for others. They were doing exactly what Jesus told the disciples to do, to go throughout the world and to take the stories of Jesus and use them in real life. What are those stories? to actually see the people around us, to see the ones that often are forgotten or ignored. We're seeing them very clearly right now with the viral scare because they're the ones who are still in place trying to do what's good for the people around them. They are the healthcare workers. They are the janitors. They are the people who prepare food. They are the people who try to figure out in times that are unlike any we've known before how to still bring worship to the people they love. Nobody is invisible. Every one of us has a place in the world. And Jesus taught us that. When Jesus left the earth. He left the task of telling the people about what was pleasing to God to the disciples. And every generation, we are the disciples. We learn again every Easter morning that we're set on a task. Whether or not we feel up to the task is immaterial. There are things to be done and if we can figure out how to do them, even if it's in a different way than we've usually done them, as long as we work together for the good of the kingdom, we're doing what Jesus asked us to do. All Jesus asks of any of us is to do our parts, to find the motivation and develop the skills that are needed to do the tasks at hand. That may be singing, that may be preaching alone, really, that's, that's the least part of it is the preaching. It may be finding the people who feel really, really scared and alone and making sure you can call them on the phone or um, Send them an email if they have, have an email. Do something that makes their life better that day. Every one of us has the possibility of making the world a better place. And that's what Easter is all about. Jesus is unleashed from time and space. Jesus is in every generation. Jesus is in every Easter service. Jesus is there telling us all that we have work to do and that he's watching to make sure we do it. It's a little intimidating. Who am I kidding? It's a lot of intimidating some days. But it's possible because Jesus is right there with us. That is the joy of Easter morning. That through all time and space we're never going to be alone that Jesus will be there helping us with direction, helping us to find the talents, helping us to know what works in the world and what doesn't by using what he said, how he acted, and the prayers he left for us as our God. Easter morning is about joy in the midst of despair. It's about possibility in the midst of discouragement. It's about knowing in our hearts 
that some days these pews will be full again and we'll feel more normal, but we'll never feel more called than we are this day and every day in this crisis. It's really easy to sing praises when everything's going well, but it's really necessary to sing praises when the world is scared and when we feel alone. He calls us to sing praises in every condition of our lives and to know that what we are called to do is to love. Pure, simple love for our neighbors, for our families, for the world. And if we do that, we cannot go far wrong. I bid you peace on this blessed day and say again, Christ is risen, hallelujah. Thanks be to God. This is the good news. We're going to hear today a creed that is, is in many of your hearts and memories. So if you know this one, um, say it right along with me. We're going to have the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please pray with me our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our last hymn for today is, Lo, in a grave he laid. There are three verses. If you at home know this hymn, sing it out. Uh, you probably know the chorus, even if you don't know the verses.
God, I got those my notes out. I'm 68. <laughs> Go forth into the world to serve God with gladness. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.